Hello, welcome to We Are Here Focusing on Solutions. I'm Sue Pratt along with my partner Jerome Tillman and today our topic is the National Multicultural Interpreter Project which is something that we think you're going to be hearing a whole lot about across the country. Our guests, Dr. Glenn B. Anderson, we have Jan Nishimura and Mary Mooney and I'm going to turn to you Mary and ask you if you would talk to us about your background and why you're here involved in this project. Well thank you and I'm going to sign so there's a visual impact to our audience but uh, normally we would use interpreter services but my uh, involvement is as project as project director and I work here at El Paso Community College and we have established uh, an interpreter training program that has been here since the 1970s. We have been focusing our efforts on working and serving um, the deaf community primarily from the Hispanic community's viewpoint. But now we have the opportunity to expand to a national perspective and include much more an emphasis on a variety of cultural groups. So thank you for having us here today. And thank you for joining us, Jerome. Well, let's take a minute, uh, Dr. Anderson, I want to say, and it's uh, Nishimura. I want to, Jan Nishimura, I want to make sure I pronounce that properly because my name gets butchered sometimes. Uh, Dr. Anderson, if you would, please give us a little background and some of the reasons why you're involved in this project. Sure, I've been at the University of Arkansas since 1982. And I'm uh, doing rehabilitation work uh, research for deaf and hard of hearing people. And I'm doing training with the center there. And also, I'm a full-time uh, professor in the Department of Research. And also, I'm the chairperson of Gallaudet University's Board of Trustees. And I'm a native of Chicago, Illinois. And thank you for having me on the program. Well, I was assigned in Chicago at uh, Fort Sheridan, Illinois, and I grew up in Washington, D.C. We may have an opportunity to compare backgrounds at some point while you're in El Paso, and I want to welcome you here. Jan Nishimura, some of your background and some of the reasons why you're involved in the project. I seem to share a similar background with the two of you. I'm also a native of Chicago, now living in Washington, D.C. I'm co-founder and vice president of Sign Language Associates, in, which is a full-time interpreting service provider. I believe we're the first um, company to be established by interpreters. That's one of my, my many hats. I'm working with the project as the lead consultant, focusing on the cultural aspects of the Asian community. And I also thank you for inviting me to be part of this program. And Mary, let's jump back to you. And again, we do um, welcome our guests. We're glad to have you here. Anyone who has been around you for any length of time can really see the excitement that you have uh, for this National Multicultural Interpreter Project. Could you talk to us in a little more detail about what the project is, its specific goals, again, why it was created, and I think we heard that during our introductions, and then what partners or what organizations form the partnership that will make this a successful program? Okay, well that's a, a very complex question and I'm going to start with making it simple as possible. The U.S. Department of Education in Washington, D.C. Uh, establishes priorities on a five-year cycle of time that establishes a focus on interpreter training projects. Already in existence are ten regional projects that are serving their state areas. Uh, one of the reasons um, that Dr. Anderson and I are connected is that the University of Arkansas at Little Rock was very significant in assisting us to kind of have the writing efforts and the expertise to apply and receive a federal grant. This is the first time for El Paso Community College in interpreter training area, so we're really excited at El Paso Community College to have this opportunity. But as the regional projects are serving their states with an emphasis on providing in, um, interpreter training and education, the two national priorities have been established. One serves deaf-blind uh, deaf community members, and that is in the northeast area of our country. And then we have the focus on the priority of multicultural. In order to create a project, 
that you have a home in El Paso, Texas, we needed to involve national participants at every level of the process. So instead of writing a grant that where we took responsibility to do everything from the El Paso perspective, that's really not the perspective of the project. We've involved national organizations. Let me just mention a few that are involved. The first is the Registry of Interpreters for the Deaf. That's our professional interpreter organization, so the president from that organization is participating in our advisory board. And I'm going to mention all the organizations, and I think it is important that each organization has sent either their president or their chair or their significant leader representative to be included with us. The second organization is the Conference of Interpreter Trainers. That's an organization of professional interpreter educators like myself. Then we have the deaf communities uh, organizations that have already been established. Uh, a very significant one is the National Black Deaf Advocates Association. A second is the National Hispanic Council. And a third is the Intertribal Deaf Council. And the Deaf uh, American community is now in the process of establishing and meeting on a regular basis. So again, it is truly a first attempt to put all of the leadership together to assist us in developing the goals and philosophy. But specifically, we are to address the needs of curriculum writing so that that curriculum that takes all of our um, concerns, uh, knowledge from many years of life experiences, puts that in the curriculum and then shares that through the regional projects that I just talked about and their 100 uh, college programs that are already there. If I may, talking about curriculums as an example, the minority population in the United States is on the rise. We should therefore conclude that the population of deaf consumers is likewise on the rise. Is there a need for diversity training to be built into the various curricula that you're talking about? And uh, I'll, if I may, uh, Ms. Nishimura, I'd ask you to respond to that question first, followed by Dr. Anderson. From an interpreter perspective, as interpreters, one of our responsibilities is to faithfully render the spirit and intent of the message. And so much, so much of the message is embedded, not just in the terms that are used, but the semantics, the culture, the behaviors, the norms, and the values of that culture. So for me or for any interpreter to function successfully and to provide the appropriate message, I would have to be in tune or aware of, aware of these norms, values, et cetera, the culture of the participants involved. So yes, I see a great need for interpreters to be aware of the various cultural issues that may arise during an assignment. And before Dr. Anderson answers, could you give us a specific example of something that could come up in an interpreting situation? I was once working with a young deaf woman from Japan. Fortunately for me, I have a little bit of a knowledge of the culture. I'm a third generation Japanese American. And one of the behaviors that I see among people from Japan is a tendency to not respond too eagerly. If I want to do something and you ask me, Jan, would you like to do this? I would say, oh, no, no, you know, please don't bother. Then you ask again, and I say, oh, no. But in behind, I really want to do this. So when I worked with this young deaf woman from Japan, I knew from the behavior that, no, I'm thinking, she probably wants to. And the third time the question was asked, her response was, which looked like it may have been a head shake, meaning no, but the twist gave it a yes meaning. So knowing that, I was able to respond appropriately. Well, I know for myself, and then Dr. Anderson will come to you in just a minute. The first time she told me, well, I really don't want to, I would have gone to the next person. So I can see where understanding those colloquialisms and those folkways would be important. Uh, Dr. Anderson, from your perspective, pretty much the same question. 
why do we need to build diversity into the communication process and into the curriculum uh, for the deaf consumer? I think in your earlier comments you mentioned that uh, the American population is in the process of transition. Uh, the population is becoming more and more diverse and that is having an impact on the deaf community as well. And the deaf community itself is becoming more and more diverse. And we're having more deaf person, uh, deaf members from uh, a variety of ethnic, ethnic backgrounds. But at the same time, many of those people uh, who are working in different professions uh, need interpreters. Oh, how are the, the, mo the majority of interpreters are from a European background. So when they're asked to um, work in many assignments uh, with other ethnic backgrounds, they have no prior experience working with those deaf people who represent this uh, variety of cultures. So I think that's an extremely important uh, time for this project to be uh, happening right now uh, here at El Paso Community College. This is a place where we can begin to focus and better prepare, for our, inter better prepare our interpreters uh, from diverse cultures. Well, another thought for me as, as well. There are American folkways and mores and there are the folkways and mores of the country of origin. Uh, and then, uh, Ms. Nishimura, I want to ask you, how do you make that distinction? You could see yourself as an example, and someone would possibly treat you as you talked about the lady who was hesitant, at least ostensibly hesitant, to commit to whatever the task is. But if I'm just looking at you, I would say, that you were not American, I would say you were more Japanese. Now, how do you, how do you reconcile that for the person who's lived in the country as long as you have, as an example? Education. I think that your comment clarifies the need for diversity and sensitivity training because many of us are not aware of our own culture or our own sense of who we are and our belief systems. So for me to be effective in working with deaf people from other cultures or hearing people from other cultures, I have to know who I am and how I am going to impact the situation. Interpreting in a multicultural setting is a very complex issue and it's complex because it's subtle. So the first part is self-awareness. Second, realizing that I have a responsibility to educate people about who I am and also to provide assurances that I am a competent professional and able to do the job and that when it comes time to providing interpreting services, that I am taking all of these factors into consideration. Thank you very much. And we'll be right back with our guests. We're discussing the National Multicultural Interpreting Project. Please stay with us. If you took away a star for every one million people who didn't vote, and a stripe for every five million non-voters, and a patch of blue for the 10 million people who didn't care. Exactly what kind of flag are we waving? Welcome back, I'm Sue Pratt along with my partner Jerome Tillman. And our topic today is the National Multicultural Interpreting Project. Our guests, Dr. Glenn Anderson, Ms. Jan Nishimura, and Ms. Mary Mooney. And Mary, again, we'll start with you. And approximately 90% of the current interpreters are white or Euro-American females. And while we have to recognize the contribution and the professionalism that they have made to the field, what are some of the concerns that have been expressed as far as multicultural, multiculturalism and diversity? Well, that is true. Uh, again, the balance is shifted for female and from Euro-American backgrounds. So again, I kind of represent uh, the kind of interpreter you might meet as you go across the United States of America. But um, there are several things that do impact all of us. First, 
all of us as professional interpreters want to provide the highest quality services possible. So how do we do that? First of all, we need to be taught, educated, and sensitized to these deaf and cultural issues of deaf and hearing people in general. And I think that is part of what we're seeing in the U.S. across. And I'm hoping that, again, projects like this will have an impact positively. So first, we need that education because we're going to continue to be providing interpreter services. But second, after having been provided cultural background information and making a realistic assessment of my professional skills, maybe the best decision that I can make as a professional interpreter is to say that I am not the best person qualified for this specific situation. Now that's not all situations. For example, I could interpret for Dr. Anderson in some situation in which it didn't matter. A professional level interpreter, information is conveyed. But let's say, for example, uh, we're working in a situation like um, Jan was just recently mentioning about the Japanese American person. and. I feel that I'm not comfortable, I don't know enough, I may miss, as you say, some of the, um, the signing nuances that that deaf person may use, or the hearing speaker might be presenting. So I have some choices. I can refer that person to another qualified interpreter who has the cultural background, or even another strategy may be that we may team and create a partnership with the second interpreter. Oftentimes, and I want to add this because it's so critical, that second interpreter could be a deaf person who has the cultural background. And I think part of the problem that, and the reason that the National Multicultural Interpreter Project started is because you can't always find someone from another cultural or ethnic background to be available. How do you plan to go about recruiting people to become interpreters and to take the interpreters that you currently have and educate them about multiculturalism? Again, you're exactly right. We have to make the balance more appropriate to the diversity within the United States. How do we do that? We must involve the leadership of the different cultural groups that we mentioned before. They've had experience working in their communities. Many of the deaf adults have children who have natural sign language skills that can be transferred into a professional area from a private home life experience with increased training and educational opportunities. So we need to ask that cultural group for assistance to us in identifying the proper strategies. And each cultural group may have a different uh, place that they th finding um, and recruiting interpreters would be the best, you know, and most effective. Right, well, Dr. Anderson, Washington, D.C. is predominantly African American, at least the last time I was there. That's what, uh, that's what it appeared to be ostensibly. You do a lecture series interpreting in the African American community. What are some of the unique aspects about signing in the African American community? And what is the ethnic makeup of Gallaudet College? Well, you've got three questions in one there. That's right, <laughs> trying to be economic. That's okay. That's all right. Washington, D.C. is still predominantly African-American. I think it's about 80%. Now, related to Gallaudet University, it's about 25% of the student population are from diverse uh, ethnic racial backgrounds. Now, in relation to interpreting for African-American individuals, I, you know, to talk about the interpreting process itself. Oftentimes, deaf individuals are not aware or don't know a specific interpreter who may show up for their uh, interpreting assignment. So the part of that process involves uh, developing a comfort level to develop trust and also a rapport with the person. And that's not an easy thing to do. And especially when two people don't know each other, and oftentimes that requires where you have to share personal information about your life. So that comfort level can be uh, comfort developed quickly and successfully when two people, um, if two people have two different, different uh, racial backgrounds, that could increase 
the problems when you're, you're not familiar with the culture and perhaps not familiar with the person's style of signing. For example, in Arkansas, many of the black deaf people live um, outside of the big city. They live in the rural areas. So they live in, in these pockets uh, outside of the area. And they're not necessarily in the mainstream of the deaf community. And many of those, many of those people attended segregated schools for deaf students. And they have unique ways of signing. So interpreters are often sent out to those areas and they have no way of understanding uh, this style of signing. So you have a, a problem establishing that kind of rapport and then the process breaks down. So it's how do we resolve those problems? And one idea is that when Mary suggested here is having deaf people working uh, as interpreters as well. Those people who are familiar with the culture and familiar with the uh, particular signing usage. And also, in addition to the project, they would do a better job of preparing interpreters uh, for working in those particular kinds of situations. Well, it, it, it seems to me this is not a unique problem. People who are very skilled audibly still have the same kinds of, of problems. So I, I guess my, my message or statement I'd like to make in follow-up is the same kinds of issues that the deaf community is confronted with speaking to each other, we deal with in the majority community as well. And I just throw that out as an observation. Nobody's unique in that regard. We all have to work to try to understand each other a little better. Sue? And let's talk about people who might be watching the program and <coughs> might not have ever thought of interpreting as a profession, for example. What requirements exist for a person to become an interpreter and that'll be the first part of the question for Mary. And then Jan, if you could address also um, what it takes to become certified. Is there a code of ethics? There seem to be some confidentiality issues that would be at play here too. And Mary? First of all, we do want to encourage anyone who's interested in our profession to contact us through this project. And obviously, I hope it's clear, we're, we're welcoming all interest in our field, but focusing our efforts now on recruiting persons from diverse cultural backgrounds. I think it is important, Jerome, that we establish um, new programs in places where the communities are already there. I think that's the success of El Paso Community College is we have a rich resource here of 80% Hispanic population, so our contribution to our field is oftentimes we can produce a graduate who speaks Spanish as a home language, has high English skills, and also is learning American Sign Language. So they are trilingual, and that's a value-added skill. Not only are they competent interpreters in many fields and could work any place in the U.S., but they uh, have, again, as I like to call it, a value-added ability because of their cultural background adding to the skills. But we all need a broad educational background because as we work as interpreters, we may be showing up in court, we may be going to a serious medical situation, working in a mental health environment, and that alone without even the additional complexities of cultural issue means a broad vocabulary, a broad knowledge, and uh, an eagerness for language communication, an eagerness to continue our general education development and our cultural awareness. Okay, and Jan, if you could address the issues of certification, confidentiality, and ethics. Oh, I'd be glad to. The RID, Registry of Interpreters for the Deaf, is our professional organization, and it also administers a testing system which provides certification for interpreters. To become a member, even, of the RID, one must sign an agreement to abide by the Code of Ethics. And the Code of Ethics sets forth the standard expectation levels of professional behavior for the field. And it's assurance to deaf and hearing consumers about what is expected from an interpreter's behavior. One of the most important tenets of the Code of Ethics is that of confidentiality, that everything that we interpret remains wherever we interpret. And the value behind that is respect for communication. 
RID is one organization that provides certification through testing, and there are a number of states that offer their own quality assurance tests, as well as a test that's being given by the National Association of the Deaf. You know, if, if I may, and I don't, I don't want us to run out of time before we appropriately acknowledge uh, Amelia Laurenti from Atlanta and John Lewis of Washington, D.C., who are present in the studio and are helping to facilitate the very dialogue that we are engaged in around the table. So just want to make sure that they are known and that we express our appreciation for them. Uh, the more ways we know how to communicate, the better off we're all going to be. And Mary, why don't we, as we prepare to close the program, again, the National Multicultural Interpreting Project, sponsored by El Paso Community College. Could you give us, again, in a nutshell, very briefly, a rundown of what this project is and a number to call for additional information? Certainly. It's um, an educational project to focus on recruiting persons from culturally diverse backgrounds into our profession. We're writing curriculum that can be shared with all students, trainers, and our field collecting the life experiences of many different people and involving the leadership of our deaf community at every level. And we want to have an impact and increase services to our deaf community from any background and develop, most importantly, partnership and team respect for all interpreters working together. And the telephone number? And the telephone number is 915 in El Paso, 594-3187. Thank you, Mary. And we're out of time. Our guests have been Dr. Glenn Anderson, Ms. Jan Nishimura, and Ms. Mary Mooney. Our topic, the National Multicultural Interpreter Project. On behalf of my partner, Jerome Tillman, I'm Sue Pratt. Thank you for joining us.